30 or 40, even 50 years ago, there was a great science going on of isolated organ. In fact, it under, has underwritten to a very large degree a lot of the transplant clinical success. For example, an isolated kidney organ, an isolated heart had been one for a long time, an isolated lung. Isolated organs can be brought to life even though they've been removed from the animal's corpse some time after death. Here's a dog's heart. It can function as well in artificial conditions as in a living organism. And for this purpose, blood is introduced into the cardiac vessels. The isolated heart beats just as it did a few hours previously in the living dog. Well, a lot of people in those years were very much interested in the isolated brain. And there were a lot of world-class people trying to isolate the brain. But nobody seemed to be able to prepare a satisfactory isolated brain preparation. It was so difficult to isolate without hurting it that if you started taking the blood vessels away, well, then there would be none going to the brain. The first thing we did was isolate the brain in a dog, which was then removed and was sutured in to the bloodstream and through an incision here in another dog. dog with the appropriate vessels exposed, sutured the vessels of the transplanted brain into those of the animal but was covered with skin, so the dog literally had two brains. Now you see, one of the advantages that we have that other isolated organ experts didn't is these were all incorporated with electrodes to record electrical activity. While this brain was in the animal's body, this animal could get up and run all over the place. When one of these brains was getting bad, well, we knew that we had to find what was wrong. So that was the first and so far the only true model of a brain transplant. We did some experiments in monkeys, which sort of did the same thing, but we used the uh, arteries in the abdomen so that the brain was internalized into the abdominal cavity. One of the questions that came up to us all the time, well, Dr. White, do you know if this brain is thinking? Is it alive? I mean, what is going through its mind? We showed him these superb EEG records. It looked normal. But people wanted to see if it was moving its eyes. They wanted to see if it would respond in any way. Now, the Russians, have claimed for the better part of a century that they had developed a two-headed dog. I've seen the two-headed dog, and the animal does have two heads. And it was a great experiment. My name was Demikhov, who's been dead for some years. But uh, the difficulty here was that this was not a uh, animal model that offered much in the human range. I couldn't figure out what the idea was of a two-headed dog. I mean, I don't think there were many parents would want the kids sticking out of there. Well, I went back to the drawing board. I realized that the only way we could do it is leave the cranial nerves, leave the nerves that are part of the brain and head connected. And thus would require something that people find inappropriate, and that would be a head transfer. Because see, one of the ethical problems that comes up with these face transplants, not a brain transplant, is that this is not a matter of life and death. These people may look terrible, and they do look a lot better with a transfer, 
facial, facial transfer. But the bottom line is that the money, the involvement here, this is not saving a life. Now the operation you and I would be talking about would save a life. The family might raise the question, why can't our relative have a total body transplant? I mean, after all, you can get a new heart, a new set of lungs, and some of the great centers, I think, in Pittsburgh, they've done as many as four or five organs. One of the great advances of the past century was the introduction of brain death as human death. And uh, I think most established religions are quite comfortable with that. How do we answer the question now? when the brain can be supported by machinery and in a sense is still alive. And it is true that medical science now believes that the definition of death is an integral part of brain function. So that when the brain is dead, that a patient, a person's dead. Now under those circumstances, it shifts a tremendous amount of responsibility onto those people who work with the brain whether they be medical neurologists or whether they be surgical neurologists. And indeed, I did have an opportunity, more in an informative way, to speak with uh, Pope Paul VI. And his main interest was really to understand and see basically what we were doing. He did not, of course, obviously, uh, pass any sort of moral judgment or approval on what we were doing or in terms of this definition. But like many religious bodies, the Catholic Church is and should be extremely interested in this area in terms of the moral decisions that are made. Paul VI I met on a number of occasions. I, I think I could consider him a friend. I really only knew two popes well, both Paul VI, the other one was John Paul II. Well, they're very much interested in medical ethics. The two of them that I knew had a really amazing knowledge of medicine. I think that in some ways, and very honestly, the idea of transplantation began to uh, dominate the whole sort of field. I mean, outside interests, both professional and unprofessional, began to focus almost exclusively on the transplant model. And then when we decided to develop the technique of transplanting the brain inside of the head, well, then of course we were overrun. I welcome the opportunity to discuss this very delicate subject, which in some ways, the, the literature, past and present, has run ahead of us in terms it of is. brain transplantation. What you're asking me, in a sense, has already been solved, even going back to the legendary Frankenstein legends and so forth. Everything right. The brain is isolated, and we must divide all of its connections for vision, hearing, and even movement, because the spinal cord, which is in the back and subserves our arms and legs, also has to be sectioned. There's no way, a way that we can sew these connections back again. But what we have been able to do in the laboratory to get around this problem is actually to transplant the brain within the head. Under these circumstances, uh, even a highly developed animal like the monkey can actually see and hear and taste, <clears throat> although it cannot enjoy any aspect of movement. It is not impossible, Tanya. And so in this situation, you were looking at an A animal body supporting a B animal's brain. Because this way it could see, taste, and smell. And so even in the very first model that we were successful with, we knew and could see that this animal was responding in this way. One of the concepts that came forward in doing this operation, we're now talking about a brain transplant, or more correctly, a total body transplant for tetraplegic patients. 
And the idea here was you would take the uh, diseased and crippled body of the quadriplegic patient, you'd remove it and replace it with that of a young, healthy spinal cord injury patient who was brain dead. So we felt, well, the hypothermia work is there. I mean, that's really the important thing. The first process is you put the catheters or tubes in both monkeys. Then the next step is to be able to transfer these catheters from one animal, let's say body B, to head A. Okay, we now have separated the head from the body, which has been removed. And then after you've done the transfer, you've got to turn around and shorten these things. Then you've got to figure out how to get rid of these catheters and sew the vessels together. Well, if, 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 if the vessels are sewed together, I think then the, uh, the principal problem becomes one of rejection, tissue rejection. And also you were able to put the spine together. See, the one of the things that everybody forgets is you've got to work with the spine and the spinal cord. Now, it doesn't make any difference whether we sew the spinal cord together or not. It just is not going to work. And so you've got to do a lot of delicate work down there in the spinal column with the spinal cord, with its vasculature, so that when you finally bring the head over, you just slide it down and you just put in a few screws. We very often drain the body that is not being used. We drain the blood from that into the other animal as a transfusion. There should be another catheter in the esophagus of the body, which is going to sustain the head, and you can use that for feeding purposes. Well, I think we'll hang in for about another 15 at 16 minutes. You realize that the monkey was not specifically trained to demonstrate uh, intellectual capability. But as soon as it's been decided for this animal to be, to be awakened, well, I can tell you that because we left the cranial nerves, it could hear, it could smell, it could taste, it would eat, and it would follow you around the room. The tubes that were placed in the mouth, you could see them chewing on them and we also see it was a very unhappy monkey, but I remember how we felt because what we had transferred here was, yes, another great number of organs, but we had, in my judgment, transferred the soul, the living principle of this animal, and of course could be done in human. something as complicated as a DNA molecule being formed by random collisions of atoms in a primeval ocean is incredibly small. Dr. Hawking is somebody that nobody cannot admire. He has been almost a living person supported by computer technology, but he is already very limited in terms of body movement. Are there people out there who can provide us with so much knowledge of the universe? Of course, this is up to Dr. Hawking. At some point, the issue, and I think he'll reject it, will have to be put forward, is should he or should he not have a total body transplant? His brain function, physiologically, might even improve. But the point is, that at the present time, we could do a total body transplant. Well, this sign is a result of the fact that I had a, an argument with uh, the owner of this, who's a wonderful man, by the way, wonderful man. I asked him, out there where my car is parked, I wanted him to write on the uh, asphalt, 
for MD only. Okay. They wouldn't do it. Next thing I know, he goes out and he has this sign design for me, which I thought was a little ostentatious. Officially, I'm supposed to have been retired for about 10 years now. And I really miss the opportunity to go into a room filled with high tech with a group of other people, almost invariably younger than I am, and try to save lives and to be able to do it. I've had wonderful relations with patients. I carried out some very dangerous operations under life-setting circumstances, but I think the fact to have practiced brain surgery and spinal surgery for 50 years and never had a malpractice suit brought against me, I'm very, very proud of it. You've been sitting a while, though. You've got to take it slow. Yeah. Well, there was criticism of people, very good scientific people that don't agree with, you know, the direction I've gone. To me, speaking of our work in general, that really transgresses many important intellectual fields, not, not just transplant biology, but philosophy, theology, that if what we were doing was successful, it would be crossing new divisions that had never been crossed before. This is a long interview. Too long. Transplanting of vital human organs. Get the portion of an animal's heart alive for many years. For this, he received the Nobel Prize. And I, who have so far surpassed his effort. Surely you don't want to compare yourself with Dr. Correll. He was humane. I too fight to preserve life and to find the means to improve the lives of future generations.